Hi, I am Alex Garfin, and you are watching the Permanent Rain Press. <laughs> Hi everyone, it's Chloe with the Permanent Rain Press today. I am excited to be joined by Alex Garfin. Hello, hello. How are you doing? I'm good, thank you. We were just saying before this interview began, but it's been a bit over a couple of years since we first spoke. That was for before the series premiere of Superman and Lois, so I'm really excited to be catching up. We have a lot to dive into. We have so much to dive into. Character changes, life changes. Two years older. I'm in a different country than I was last time, as evidenced by the flag behind me. And uh, I'm sure you've had a lot of changes in your life as well. So looking forward to catching up. Yeah, of course. Um, You are back home. Uh, I think you left uh, in March. So you've been back for a couple of months, but you've been very, very busy on the go. Uh, we'll start off with the foundation that you are kind of in the midst of co-founding We the Future. What can you share about this new endeavor? Oh, uh, well, not not too, too much yet. Uh, but right now, uh, me and my friend Kunal Sood, who was the man who famously brought Ted to the United Nations. Um, uh, he's also uh, the founder of uh, Novus and a, a bunch of other these uh, great collaborative organizations. Uh, we're, we're looking on a project to try to boost the communication level between Gen Z and the previous generations. Uh, how exactly we do that and everything else? Uh, well, we have a plan, but it's not so public yet. Uh, I am really excited to start sharing that with everyone uh, at the big release. So, uh, yeah, it's really exciting for now. I'm really happy I'm getting more and more involved on the global scale. Um you know, uh, a lot of people know that I'm really passionate about a bunch of these current issues. Uh, so it's really it's an honor to be able to use my platform to try to make a little dent in what is this giant peach in the middle of all of our lives. Yeah, definitely. Like what kind of goes into thinking about that? Like, I know that that's something that you've been passionate about, um, especially more so over the past few years, but even when you were younger, but what kind of kicks you and makes you say like, you know, I really want to be more involved. I really want to, you know, have something to kind of call my own and share that light with others. Well, I, you know, I think it's something shared in a lot of people, my generation, um, my generation does seem to have a large swath of us who seem to be fearless whether that is by education or ignorance <laughs> um I, as for actually getting involved uh it was a bit of i i just saw this interview with orson wells and someone asked him you know half that stuff you did in citizen kane it was your first movie and, and you seem to have broken the conventions and, and invented so many new camera techniques and so many new storytelling techniques um he goes how did you do it how did you manage to to break film on your first film? And he goes, you know, majority of it was just I didn't know that I couldn't. <laughs> it, it, was, it was the idea that he he learned what he needed to know, um, and he learned it as quickly as he could. Uh, and then post that, he didn't know he couldn't do a lot of those things. And, and you know, there is a certain... Um, uh, there's a certain uh, confidence in a even just a level of ignorance um, that allows people, I think, to just kind of dive in head first the way I did. Now that I'm deeper into the pool, I know how cold the water is. Uh, I'm, I'm a little bit more um, aware of, of uh, my surroundings at these big forums. Um, but actually just getting into it, looking back on it, uh, it was certainly a bit of an Orson Welles kind of thing. Yeah, it basically, you know, you're throwing yourself out there, see what kind of comes back at you. But I mean, you've spent time, especially more recently, you were at the UN in April. I know you were just at the Sing for Hope Gala. So clearly, you know, getting more involved with, you know, community development on um, a really personal level, getting to be exposed to all these different kind of change makers uh, as well. And you will be speaking about climate change in Dubai this winter. Is that correct? That is the plan as of now, uh, as I did in Egypt um, uh, last winter, fall, that little area in between when no one knows what to call it. Um, 
Yeah. Uh, so I spoke at COP27 um, this year at the UN Innovation Hub. Uh, I was there with the UNGSF, the Global Sustainability Fund. Uh, next year, I do believe I'll be with them again if plans stay as they are right now. Um, yeah, I, I, I mean, I really have enjoyed getting involved in my community. I've always been a member of my community. I, I always have. I've always known everyone on my block. I, I've always uh, been really active in getting to every neighborhood in New York City. I think I know the whole city really well. Whenever people come to New York, they always ask me what to do. I have a giant list of stuff. At this point, it's a copy and paste. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, it, it's interesting, right? Because when you're in a position like I am and a lot of other people that I know you've interviewed, uh, who just kind of get onto these shows, you kind of go from this observer of society to an active participant in a very dramatic and sudden way. Yeah, we were all participants in our own local community, but uh, being given the platform, being given the socioeconomic status, um, and also be, being given the connections that you do, um, it's completely changing. And, you know, I, I remember if I'm being very honest here, I, like my first year of doing Superman and Lois, it was such just as, I mean, it, so much of this industry is luck. I, I, I felt like uh, I had such an incredible amount of luck and I had such an incredible amount of gratitude for where I was at that moment. Um, they, you know, like people will always remember me as the guy in Superman and Lois who does not stop smiling. I am never happy to not be on set. I feel like I'm always very prepared. Um, I, I do have an immense amount of gratitude, but I think that also translated into me questioning why I was there, um, which is, which is a, it's a, it's a part of the process. Right. And someone really wise, my friend Uzi, I remember he looked me in the eye and he said, it doesn't matter why you're here. It matters what you're going to do with it. And those, those words in essence changed a lot, a large part of my life. Um, cause it's true. And my question did shift to what I'm going to do with it. Um, which in the beginning availed to a similar crisis, but now I'm starting to get some answers. Um, I feel like I have a lot of more unique opinions on these large scale issues. And I feel like, uh, my, my skills that I've gained as an actor in, in networking, but in also communicating, uh, have proved really useful in some of these more, uh, impactful not more impactful but some of these more um diplomatic and also um in, in the charitable space um like other other areas of both the public and private sectors um so yeah uh it, it's it's been a crazy little journey here uh and it's only just beginning uh you know i'm, I'm 19 now uh, I'm, I'm not 20 yet uh, so I guess I can't exactly start the under 20 forum or anything like that. But um, I, I do feel like uh, I'm at a position that people my age aren't not. And, and again, it's it's because I'm standing on top of a massive amount of luck from Superman. I'm not trying to give myself more credit than I'm due. But it does give me a unique opportunity to share the voices of the people my age in rooms that we otherwise wouldn't be in. Um, you know, so two days ago. Uh, you mentioned Sing for Hope. I, I had a very hopeful day. Uh, I was also there at the first ever International Day of Hope. Uh, now that was at the Union League Club, uh, and they're starting to get the people and the forces together necessary to get an International Day of Hope ready at the United Nations. Uh, it's done by IFRED, uh, who was originally an uh, organization researching depression. When they realized the impact of hope on depression, they uh, changed their name to IFRA. I, I don't really know how to say it. They usually do IFRED with a little D crossed out and an H for hope. Um, and there were a bunch of amazing scientists there um, and a bunch of amazing speakers all at the Union League Club talking about hope. And um, I felt honored to be the youngest one there. Uh, I felt honored to share my voice, not only as uh, an artist present in the room, and there were other artists, but as someone Gen Z let alone a Gen Z artist, um, so let alone an actor. Um, so being who, who I am in the box that society will put you in, if, it, if, it's, a, if it's a strange enough shaped box, mm -hmm. 
Well, that's my alarm. In the middle of my tirade anyway. Look at me. There, look, you get a little view of my lovely and very teenaged room. Um, you know, they say, clean your room if you want to change the world. I need to clean my room. Um, but <laughs> but yeah, if it's, a weirdly, if it's a weird enough shaped box, it'll fit into the gears of the system in such a way that maybe it can really cause some disruptions or maybe make it run better. I mean, thank you for sharing all of that. I, I think that there's so many good things coming your way. Um, I know it's going to be a very productive and enriching year for you, uh, not only in the entertainment sphere, but outside of it. So I'm really looking forward to it. And of course, hearing more about your foundation. I guess I'll throw out the question now that was going to come later, but is June 16th something related to that? Or is it something completely different? You mentioned that, that as being an important kind of exciting day. Right, right, right. June 16th. You're like, June did I say that? Is, I think now, I... is now temporarily September something as things tend to go. Uh, but I do know what you're referencing. It's it's tangentially related. Um, I, I wouldn't say it's directly related, no. Uh, but it is tangentially related. Um yeah, yeah, and then that's again that's an announcement I'll hold off. Um because I, I, I try not to announce things that you know are, are are most likely happening just because sometimes I overestimate the most likely. Um as I did with the time frame anyway. Uh <laughs> something in motion. Yeah. We'll leave it at that. Something it, you're optimistic something, I feel about. Like there's so much emotion, there's so little still, you can't even get a good photo of it. Um, but yes, yes, there's a lot in motion. There's a lot of little plates in the air. Um, you know, I, I know you mentioned um, uh, earlier, I, I couldn't remember if it was during the recorded interview, just the, the performance over at Lamplighter in Vancouver. I do really hope to be doing that again. Music still is really a big part of my life. It's a really big passion of mine. Uh, so, you know, but, you know, Superboy and the, or potential Superboy anyway, you know, don't really give them a name yet. Um, and, uh, you know, music and attempted diplomacy. <laughs> On that music front, um, I don't think it was in the recorded portion, but you did perform your first solo live music gig at Lamplighter Pub. It was in November. Uh, I know a lot of your, your friends, coasters kind of came out to support you. So how was that experience? You know what? It was incredible to gather all those people in one room. There was a lot of people that I really loved um in vancouver relationships i made over the past three years which um at times were hard to come by vancouver can be interesting in that way um yeah uh you know it was it was definitely it was definitely an incredible experience it was also in the midst of me setting up cop 27 i really only knew about cop 27 around a week before uh so i was getting almost no sleep um and that was literally the time i spent on stage was the only break i took um you know i was taking calls at three in the morning from sweden <laughs> um so yeah it, that was a really it was a great experience i hope to do it again uh even bigger and better i continue to write songs i think at that point i had like uh, i want to say like uh 70 songs written now i have 130 something um you know it's just a big hobby of mine so it, and it only seems to be exponentially increasing what my poor friends have to listen to uh, um uh but i do hope to do a bigger and better show maybe at lamplight or maybe at another venue coming up in vancouver uh because it is a joy my dad always played music my whole life uh and for him it was a big release uh, he's a jazz drummer uh and lawyer by day uh so i always was brought up on the belief that it's the best way to unwind was your dad, did your dad get to see you perform or was he back in no. New York? Yeah, was he, he was trying to in tune York. in to your very spotty Instagram live? Because I know you tried to go live during that time and I clicked in and it was just, again, it was just not, it was not cooperating. <laughs> you know, again, I do have an iPhone 12 mini. Uh, before this iPhone 12 mini, uh, I got an iPhone 6. I had an iPhone 6 S because the headphone jack for someone that's representing the youth. I, I mean, I feel like I, 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 I'm caught up on technology. Uh, my use of technology anyway, though, is, uh, 
definitely a little spotty. I, I don't usually get the newest iPhone. That being said, I feel like there's a certain amount of breaking the iPhone after it's not uh, the newest one anymore. And like the service just goes down and the battery goes away. Um, so I'm, I'm getting to the end of this lifespan and maybe next time the live will be a little better. I also will try to like set up a, a, a real setup here um, to, to try to broadcast live a little better. Uh, I used to do it a lot, right? Back, back when I was in season like 17 in season one, I used to do it all the time. And, you know, those fans that came, we kind of had our own little community that I used to love running. Uh, and I got to know them all really well. And um, it was certainly something where all the lonely hearts all came together. Um, so, yeah, it would be really great to get back to doing those lives, maybe better and bigger than before. Might take a bit of planning, but I mean, I hope you'll be able to find the time. You've just been so, so busy, which um, is good. But in terms of Vancouver, you've really gotten around over your past two and a half years in the city. What do you most enjoy when you're in British Columbia? Um, I I mean, it's it's corny, but I enjoy the nature. Um, I, I, and you know what? More than that, uh, on a not to try to say something that would be unrelatable. I really enjoy working. I, I I go to set every day, even when I'm not working for those of you that aren't really actors. Basically, um, there's a lot of scenes you're not in. And when you're not in a scene, you're not, you don't really have to be there. Right. Uh, in fact, you really, you know, they don't even give you a trailer, right? They, you're not called in that day is what they say. You're not on the call sheet, which is the big attendance sheet that, uh, um that we all have to abide by um but for myself especially in the past year um being on set uh is such an incredible experience being with everyone that um are at the top of their field and they're doing the thing that they're at the top of the field doing uh <laughs> everyone works together in this effortless not effortless it's a lot of effort but it looks effortless grand machine with all these little little gears and 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 uh chains going around all at once that make the film uh it, it's pretty incredible uh so i go to set when i'm not called which you know for someone like me i get maybe called on like five it, it really does go like an accordion it could be two it could be it could be uh eight uh but i get called in like around five days um an episode which we take around nine and a half so nine days plus a shared day to do um but i go on um, pretty much all my off days i shadowed all the directors um i shadowed the camera department um i i got to really know what costumes does I, so i you know that was my favorite thing is getting to know every cog in the machine um and seeing how intricate they all are and how hard everyone works it made me really appreciate what everyone does I think I was reading it was um like so it was a kind of set blogger person Canada graphs and they were at a Superman and Lois set and I think they they had mentioned that they saw you know like maybe Tyler on set and then they saw you and they just might have mentioned you weren't filming a scene but there you were because um, like you mentioned you really just loved being on set and going in on your off days to hang out with everyone how did the bloggers get in <laughs> I, it was probably like it. a downtown shoot, you know, where right. you could, yeah. Right, right, right. No, no, that, that's it. That's true. I mean, um, yeah, Wale's joke is he sees me there and goes, go home. Take a break. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely a thing. Um, and, you know, I always, I make sure I have permission from everyone to be there. You don't, I don't just, just show, show up, up unannounced. <laughs> show up unannounced playing the star card you can't really get rid of me um then, no I, I i make sure that if i'm with a director i i that it's okay for me to be there and you know i think a couple times i've gotten no i i need to really focus i'm not there you know um but yeah so i make sure that there's an honest dialogue on whether or not i can be there as we kind of get into season three, I want to note for anyone watching or listening that we are discussing spoilers up until the uh, May 2nd episode, which is episode seven. Mm. Uh, so in terms of the new casting for Jonathan Kent, did you have any nerves or I would say nervous excitement 
Uh, in terms of that casting and having to find and build that chemistry in such a short period of time. Yeah, I mean, that that's a, definitely an interesting question and it shows your knowledge of acting. Um, yeah, because chemistry, especially in a show that's already been going, um, it would be tough to build, right? Um, in, in theory. You know, when, when Michael got cast, much to his credit, you know, he only really had five days between getting the official announcement and starting our first scene. And that first scene that we shot was us on the porch uh, in episode one, uh, which is obviously a brother's scene. It's just the two of us. Uh, it was a really big mission of mine in the first month, uh, really the first month and the first couple months of making sure he felt super at home on that set. First day he was at set, I showed him to every single department. I made sure everyone knew who he was. I made sure that he knew who everyone was, even though it was, I mean, I mean, by every department, I mean, I do a round of going to every department in the beginning and end of every season. And we're not just talking camera and lights. We're talking uh, accounting and and construction. Um, so I took him to everyone. Um, I really wanted to make sure that he felt like he belonged there um, in every sense of the word, that he felt like he could express his creative ideas. Now, you know that that was him that was him that actually got to do it right that was him that that had to pull that off uh but i definitely tried to facilitate as much as possible i really 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 did i really wanted him to succeed and i still really want him to succeed um you know every time someone likes him in the show uh, or likes anyone in the show by the way it's just a big win for all of us um we're all on the same team here the better the show well the longer it goes the longer we get to perform what we love we get paid to do what we love um that, that's why it is a little harder for me to understand um when when egos get too big about that kind of thing um especially just because in my in my view uh acting so much of acting is really just being i mean it, it's trying to be the most additive courier between the writer's room and the editor's desk Right. You, you know, you're, you're really trying to take this material people really slaved over, uh, which, by the way, the writers are striking right now. And writers are some of the hardest working people you will ever meet. Um, and them getting um, yeah, them getting paid uh, equitably uh, is absolutely more than necessary for the business to function. Um, but, yeah, you're you know, the set is kind of this crazy train in the in, in the conveyor belt in the factory of making this show from where all these raw materials are really being slaved over and, and and brought in put in and then it has to whip through all the departments all the things the actors have to do their own part on it and it gets to the editor's desk where it can properly be processed um it's this crazy chemical reaction in the making of a movie or a tv show um and, and and on that a lot of film acting is um just i feel like making that process as easy as it can always hitting your mark always knowing your lines uh well, you know one, one of the things i i tell new film actors a lot um like sometimes i, I, help, I help people with their self tapes um especially if they came from theater like i did and kind of had to i had to learn it myself um is that when we're communicating uh, when we're communicating on stage is a different thing. It almost feels like everyone's in on it, right? I mean, at least that's my opinion. Like everyone's in on it. You're you're in front of them. They know it's fake. You know, there, there's a certain psychological aspect of that. And yeah, you know it's fake by looking at a television, but it has this reality to it. And in reality, we really talk with our words, right? It, right now, when I'm speaking, I'm thinking about the next word to say. Uh, I, I'm not exactly... Um, I don't know all the words that I'm saying. I'm trying to put so much meaning behind them uh, in order to get the meaning across. You know, when you're doing Shakespeare, you're looking at this material and you're saying, how can I push through the material? How can I, I mean, not that I've ever taken Shakespeare. People are going to not like me for that, but I, I feel like it's a lot of like, how can I emote in such a way I, you understand it? Whereas on film, it's, you're just speaking like you are speaking. Um, so a big part of it is just the writing. 
it's respecting the writing. It's knowing that you're you're a layer of snow on the mountain of writing. Um, uh, so yeah, I, that that all loops around to say that we all help each other in that process. Um, and the more that Michael could succeed, the more we all succeed. And also, I you know I I just like seeing people succeed. So that was a big part of trying to build that chemistry was spending we spend a lot of time together, we to like each other. Um, and, and, you know, now we have a nice work relationship. That team spirit mindset collaboration is something that I think makes the show so special and you can really see it carry through on screen. Uh, in terms of you and Michael, did you talk about, you know, your likeness with the curls and the brows, like how early on did that <laughs> come up? Do you remember your very first uh, yes. meeting with him and that conversation? Yeah. Uh, I, well, I don't know if I remember the first conversation we had about that. I do remember the first meeting. It was in the screen test. Um, and yeah, uh, that was, I mean, look, he's Aussie, right? Right. So, you know, I, I you can never tell from the show. Again, he does a great job on the show. Uh, but, you know, he has an Aussie accent in real life. Uh, <laughs> so I, I, I never, I, I guess I just never really caught how much we look alike until everyone thought we were brothers until we started speaking. Uh, everyone just immediately assumed that we were brothers um and uh yeah and then now i'm seeing pictures of us um that, yeah we really do look like brothers i mean i also think there's something to be said about how incredible the hair and makeup teams are right which i feel like casting uh casting it, again it, it's a lot of it, you know, it, a lot of performances, again, a lot like that mountain in the snow. I mean, casting does an incredible amount to get these people. I, I don't even know how they do their job, to be honest. That, that's one of the most miraculous things in the world. I don't know. D David I don't, uh, David Rappaport did ours, and he's incredible. Uh, but it, and also, hair and makeup, I think, has a bit of a role in how people can really look alike. Um, I, I, like, I notice on screen we look I think so much more alike than we do in person. Like we have, we like in person, we have a bit of different skin types. Uh, you know, uh, he, the, the man himself is, 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 is quite hairy. Um, uh, like he, he, he can grow a beard in a day. Uh, they have, you know, um, much to his credit, I couldn't grow a beard in a year. Um, <laughs> so uh, on screen, we really look alike and how casting could spot that. You know what I mean? Like, and how they spotted that, how they found someone that also was a great actor, how they found someone that they knew would vibe with us. Like, you know, I, I, I on, on the notice they were given as well, like a casting department um, when they had, like, I, I, yeah, I don't know how they do what they do, uh, but in makeup department also has to be very talented to make that all happen in hair. Giving kudos to everyone, really, like you mentioned, you met him and then you, kind of found those similarities but people have noticed it way before before you noticed it and you two have become yeah. like brothers now I mean you went to Hawaii together but you've also spent a lot of time with Indy and Taylor so has it been fun to bond with cast members similar in age to yourself and kind of have that family offset yeah I mean man I you know if you if you look at the dates in which we all joined the show Indy and I are all the way back from the pilot Taylor was, well, I, I actually knew her from episode seven, just because, again, I, I try to meet everyone. Um, but, you know, she only, she really came on the show in season two, episode one. Um, and then Michael came in season three, episode one. Um, so I think we all have a bit of a different um, time scale being in Vancouver. But, you know, it's, it's, it's a great crew of very talented people. Um, look, you know, you know, uh, you don't, necessarily choose the people that you're going to be with in these things right so you have to have a certain degree of luck again that you're that first of all you're going to be compatible in a working sense right i mean and maybe it's not luck is again that is very carefully curated uh by casting and other things but you know you're hoping that you'll work and really vibe in the chemistry and on screen sense and then secondary to that you're really hoping you vibe in a personal sense i mean Again, I, I, I it must, I'm trying to give as much credit to the casting department as possible, sincerely, because both those came true. Um, we've had so many different little groups over the years here, 
you know, the friend groups change. It's, it's so strange. You know, we really, this year started associating ourselves with other people from other shows. Right. I mean, I knew Lizzie green from a while ago now, like our, our friendship goes back a little bit farther. Um, but you know, um, this Anna and a Cathcart, uh, she's a Vancouver native, um, and her and Michael go back and then we met people through her and then, uh, Michael and rainbow, um, I guess we're part of the same management. And then we read Rainbow's whole cast. It was all those school spirit folks. So then you got Milo and, 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 and Milo Mannheim and then Peyton, Peyton List and uh, and um, Spencer McPherson and also Spencer List and, you know, all the, that whole crew. Um, and then I knew Breck from a long time ago. She, Breck Bassinger, she, she's over on like um, Stargirl. Um, and um, yeah, and then her whole, little cast there of a Megan best and, and uh, Kobe Clark is like, you know, they, we had such a great group of people and um, it, outside the screen and everyone also is just so massively talented outside the screen. Uh, Vancouver can be a bit of an interesting place in that way. All these actors kind of coalesce um, in, in this otherwise uh, by population, small city. Um yeah, it was interesting. It was interesting the friend groups over the years, and that all came from the casting. That all came from uh, vibing with Indy and Taylor and, and Michael. It's so nice to see kind of um, you expanding. I want to say like that social circle, just based on also who's filming in the city, but like gelling and vibing with everyone so well. Um, uh, it's also nice to see people, you know, you all supporting each other's projects because I know Anna Cathcart. She has um, Exo Kitty coming out soon. Yes. Will you be tuning into that? Oh, of course. Of course. Um, I yeah, Anna's awesome, by the way. Um, like they're all awesome. I mean, Rain Rainbow and, and Breck are like, I think, two of my closest friends now, right? I mean, like, it's not just work relationships that we've gotten from this. It's it's real, it's real connection. Um, so yeah, um, absolutely everyone tune into Exo Kitty, everyone tune into school spirits, it's already out. It's a great show. It's Where's that season written. two? Rainbow is really good as Claire. I need to see more of this show. I know. I want another season for them on a personal level as well, but also on a professional level. I mean, it, it just had an incredibly talented cast, an incredibly talented crew. Um, you know, uh, if you really, if you want some Vancouver Inside Secrets, we shot at the same school. The school from School Spirits is actually Smallville High. Um, <laughs> so, you know, look out for those little things as well. It will keep you watching. But I don't think that will need to be uh, the thing to keep you watching. I think the writing and the acting and everything else will be enough. It's also shot so interestingly. Um, yeah, just, just everyone tune in to School Spirits. I, I'm, I'm promoting things not on the, the, the corporate agenda. But, yeah, to, to tune into School Spirits, to tune into... Um, um, yeah, uh, Exo Kitty. Um, yeah, there's so many great projects going around right now. Hey, you're promoting your friends. There is absolutely no harm in that. Like you mentioned, it's almost something yeah. that I feel like it's, you know, in the in the show standpoint, you're like, okay, you're kind of competing, but really it's making good television. That and that's what pushes, you know, shows like you would say your own probably to to do more and be better is because there's so much great programming out there nowadays. Right. And you know what? It's, you know, the thing, the thing about competition is that, yeah, if there are two trees in a little dirt square on a sidewalk, right, they're going to be competing for resources, right? But when you got a forest, are you really competing? No, you're all just trying to grow, right? Um, so I, I, I do think like, in this age of real unlimited content, I, 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 I don't believe too much in competition. I don't believe too much in competition um, outside the athletic space anyway. I, I just, uh, collaboration will always be a more powerful tool um, and it will always be the better aspects of who we are that allow us to co collaborate, um, uh, in my opinion. Even if you're collaborating for something nefarious, I think it's the better aspects that allow you to collaborate. And um, it, so... Yeah, I think we're all just our own little. I guess we're saplings. I, I maybe, maybe, maybe not. Uh, maybe not. Um, some of these other people with big, big, 
names already, but like, you know, I, I think we're all in the same forest here. We all just trying to grow. So speaking about growth growing, what have you most enjoyed about Jordan Kent's growth across these three seasons? Oh man, where do I even start? Okay, um, so look, look if you, uh, my, my, I think my goals have shifted slightly. I, I really love film now. Um, I, I, I like that. That's like, that's not now a bit of my obsession. Uh, my lifelong obsession up until recently was television. Like, you know, if you ask me what kind of actor I wanted to be after I really started loving acting, uh. It was never Leo DiCaprio. It was always Brian Cranston. Uh, it, you know, it was always the guy that was able to take something over years and develop it and change and grow. You know, if the show goes for eight years, eight years, and we hear about these eight season shows all the time. I mean, Supernatural was like 15, right? Eight years of a show, seven years of a show. Let's say seven years of a show, right? Uh, I'm, I'm 19 now. That would have started when I was 12. If I was watching that every week, for, for for half the year um i i mean what a what i mean what what a journey you go on with these characters you grow up with these characters you, these characters become who you are and, and in that the actors change and in that the, the 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 actual characters themselves change you change i mean what better way to tell a story than in real time and <laughs> so uh I always wanted that, right? I, I always wanted a series regular where the character got to change. And man, I mean, I look look at that. My my, my dream came true. Um, it, you know, I, it, you know, season one, it was very intentional. That he started very quiet. Uh, that he started at a a low point in his life. He was blowing up a lot. And again, I I think um, I I've heard, I don't really read the fan reactions because again, I'm not trying to feel weirdly competitive uh but you know from what i've heard people people uh you know there was a weird reaction to like him being very outspoken in the beginning of the season honestly again i think within the context it was reasonable and i think the writers put a lot of thought into that and i think it was correct thought and that he was bullied and with an absent father for like 14 years of his life before moving to smallville um and um yeah and then he goes from this really dark place to being understood and my little dog is going to start barking. I apologize. This is him. His name is Felix. Um, Felix, look at the camera. So can you see permanent rain? No, you can't say anything. You're a dog. Um, there you go. Um, yeah, so you, see, you know, you see him in season one. He, uh, he, he's really quiet. He's very reserved. Um, is a tendency to kind of uh, kind of lash out his parents. Uh, you see this unstable entity all of a sudden get a lot of responsibility. And how does that go? Right? How, how does that happen? Uh, all of a sudden, this, these superpowers are placed on him and he could kill people and he doesn't mean to. Um, and he doesn't really understand the gravity of the superpowers as viewers we do, right? As viewers, we're used to them. He's never really seen superpowers, right? He gets this thing he's never really interacted with. His dad never did it around him in a way that he's seen. Um, so he doesn't understand that. I mean, you know, in episode six, one six, uh, he he could have punched that kid's head off and said broke his brother's arm. Um, I attribute that again to him not really understanding his own power. Um, what what is what does someone like that do when they're having trouble growing up and all of a sudden they get all this responsibility? Um, well, in some cases like Jordan, they grow up to the challenge slowly and, and with troubles and trials and tribulations. And we see that we see them start to falter at times. Um, but ultimately now he's progressed to this point that he has had, um, in the last episode where he's landing like a super, like a certain comic book hero that I had to practice that landing many times, by the way, um, in a super suit, and he's trying to save his dad. Who thought that the kid with anxiety, with, with developmental, you know, um, tribulations, um, you know, the, the kid that couldn't seem to 
make friends or find his way in the world? Who thought that that kid would be saving Superman in three years? And who thought it could be a journey that we could all watch and believe? That's magic. I mean, I, 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 yeah. Like that progression, I love that we kind of get to see that on screen. It doesn't make sense for him to be like, let's say, a bit more upbeat, like having that kind of social aspect and taking in parts of, you know, his anxiety disorder, I think. Um, it says a lot and then who he is today. I'm curious, like, where do you think Jordan's mindset is at um, in these high pressure situations starting in season three, episode one, we had the Malaysia incident because he's still kind of figuring out his responsibility and ability to control his powers. Right. I love that. The Malaysia incident. Um, yes. Uh, you know, at that point, we see him attempt to, to attempt to do good and end up doing more harm than good uh, on a on a scale that could be truly terrifying, right? I mean, there could be lives at stake. Although then again, these are superhero superhero shows where the city is destroyed at the end and they're still high-fiving each other. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I, I mean, look, that was, a, that was a part of it, right? That was someone not understanding um, how much they didn't know. Uh, you know, there's a thing called the Dunning-Kruger effect, not to get too into it but like you know there's a there's a graph here right and uh this is how much you think you know meanwhile this is how much you really do know as you learn and uh goes like this like this and like this so you think you know nothing you know nothing you know a little bit you think you know everything then you realize you know very little you don't think you know very much but you do actually know some and then slowly you gain expertise so you know we 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 saw him right <laughs> now we're starting to see him <laughs> quite literally he was up here and <laughs> in the right. air that yeah right that was my visual aid right Mind it's always a learning oh. lesson with Alex. Um, right. His relationship with Sarah is something that's so special to him. He has trouble kind of letting that romantic aspect go. So what like what do you think Jordan is drawn to with Sarah? Um, what makes their relationship and bond so important to him? So so Jordan is drawn. To, um, I'm speaking on the authority as an actor, not as a writer. So take it with that grain of salt. But um, Jordan is drawn to the connection that he had with Sarah. He never had that connection before. He never felt really understood by anyone ever, ever before. He moves to Smallville. All of a sudden, he feels understood. Not only that, they're dating. Um, and now that connection's been severed due to forces that he doesn't really understand. He in part blames himself for, and he doesn't really understand why. Um, I think we saw a, a bit of, again, from an actor's perspective, a bit of unfair treatment in the fact that he was apologizing that Sarah cheated on him in a way. Um, so, I, I, you know, in, in the same way that Jordan is damaged, Sarah is damaged as well. They're both very young. And when you're that young, you don't know how not to damage other people. Um, so I, I think all of that culminated in him having all these feelings and them now not being reciprocated and him not knowing why. So he feels like it, it's just a matter of feeling more and, and expressing it to her more that will get them back to the place. Little does he know they've already gone off the cliff, you know, um, or, you know, off that cliff, who knows what may form, but, um, you know, he just doesn't understand that the way out of this is out. And he still thinks he can save this by just being more and more intense. It's what got him there in the first place. I really think that that's an interesting standpoint. Um, for you and like how you see it because uh, they do have discussions Sarah asks him to respect her time and space um so like character wise I know you can't spoil what's going to happen but I think he he could still be holding out hope for for their relationship it's funny I said the word hope get flashing hope now um <laughs> so much hope so much hope um yeah, he's still holding on to hope. And it's like, I don't even think it's hope for him. I think it's, uh, it's a guarantee. I think he thinks... He sees them as end game. <laughs> right. He's... Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 
he's planning the wedding. He's uh, he's looking at houses, going, I don't know if she likes blue. You know, it, <laughs> and you know, the other thing he has is secret powers that she has seen a little bit of, but not that much. I mean, if that don't impress her, what will from that standpoint? Right? I mean, come on. I, like, bruh, I'm literally the son of Superman. Why aren't you into me? What more could you ask for? Just saying. From his perspective. Uh, <laughs> Um, in terms yeah, of a, <laughs> a couple episodes I did want to mention um sorry for cutting off you can finish your thought but um John sure. has been spending more time with Sarah he kind of makes that comment about Sarah likes the um was it like the the back of his shirt that he got from the fire hall um that wasn't played out in the past episode that we saw but maybe it would come back because I I'm pretty sure that would cause a rift between the two brothers Oh, yeah. I mean, we see it in, in episode 107. He punches the wall because they're talking to each other. That being said, he was younger then. That being said, he didn't understand he could punch through a wall. All that good stuff. And he was also sick, right? He had the ear thing. Um, it, it definitely. I mean, I, I think it definitely could. But we'll see what ends up happening. Um, but we'll see. We'll see. Again, it's just a... Uh, it's, uh, it's an interesting season how it plays out. We can't understate the impact of their mom being sick um, on their psyche at this point as well. Their mom is really sick. Um, she's really frail. She was the powerful one in the house, ironically, but that's the dichotomy they like to play constantly is that she's the powerful one. Um, so seeing her weakened is very intense, especially on Jonathan. Uh, I think for them, they have this connection. Um, this really deep connection now because they're both unpowered uh, and Jordan has learned this invulnerability. Uh, and we see that play out in the last episode uh, where, where Jonathan really um, is very raw about the whole thing. Um, he also gets to go to like the fortress and meet Hollow Grandma, although he met them he met them in uh, episode um, 301 and 215, but like really interact with her anyway. Yeah, so I will want to get into Lois's cancer diagnosis, but just before we move on to that, like, have you spoke with Indy a lot about Jordan and Sarah's relationship? Maybe talk through some of those one-on-one -on -one scenes because you did kind of share a couple already this season. I know uh, maybe it was in season two towards the end. Like, we, we don't always get to see just the two of them interact together. Right. Um, yes, we, we try to talk through the scenes that we're given. Um some or you know uh you know I, I i at least try to think through all the scenes that i'm given um try to talk about it and how to make it different sometimes it could be uh like teenagers do falling into the same conversations right that's intentional um i'm sure on the writer's part uh but then as an actor your job is to make that each and every one their own unique thing uh so that's a part of it um you know, this is a season of fights for them so far. Um, you know, we, we, you know, we're used to liking each other and hating each other and liking each other. Um, so, yeah, yeah, and, and, we know. And the other thing I think we have to acknowledge about Jordan and Sarah is that we get a really deep dive into Sarah's life, right? I mean, the Cushing storyline takes up a big part of the screen time on our show. And that's to show this normal family dealing with normal stuff as Superman's doing their stuff. And uh, also because we get invested in their lives. Um, so, yeah, I, I think we get a really deep dive into why Sarah is behaving as she is. You know, that's a thing, right? Um, you know, an explanation is not an excuse, right? But we, we tend to judge harshly upon the things we can't see, mainly because we only see the outcome, right? Uh, it, it's 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 almost like that thing of like, if uh, if, if you yourself know you have a fault, you'll judge it less than other people. Uh, whereas you'll judge a fault you don't have so severely at times. Um, you know, it's it's because you understand what caused it. From Jordan's point of view, he's not there for a lot of Sarah's troubles. From our point of view, we are. 
right? And likewise with Sarah. So, yeah, I, I think that's also, it's a dramatic irony in a sense there too, um, that relationship. So yeah, India and I have to talk about a lot of that stuff. And is she really good to kind of speak with about that stuff because she has done I think also it's a lot of compliments it's so well this season especially with what you know is going on between her parents and you know just last episode she was having to interact with Chrissy more in terms of being the, the dad's new love interest and it's a lot for someone to go through and unfortunately you know with her and Jordan kind of being on a break and sometimes um, they're not spending as much time together she's spending more time with Nat he doesn't know what's going on in her personal life yes yes um yeah she also has done really well uh, and um i think both of them i think everyone does um i think taylor is just also um just an incredible actress i think indy is an incredible actress um and we all have to support each other in that way um i also like their friendship like you were saying i like their friendship a lot um i like nat and sarah um the, you know the two young women of the show, um, they both get, excuse me, on. Um, it's even early over there, isn't it? It's like 7 a.m. over there, isn't it? Well, or now it's, it's, eight. it's 8 now. So <laughs> it's 8 now. It was early. Talk, talk from 7 to 8. That's the goal. That is the goal. Um, yes. I think Indy, Indy has had to do a lot this season, as she's had to do every season. Uh, everyone is, of course, impressed with her incredible work because it's incredible work. Um, as with Taylor coming in season two, you know, she also had to come into the show a little later, uh, a lot like Michael. So, and she just fit in like a glove. Um, yeah. I, I, and then also Bitsy's work this season. I mean, not even I'm kidding. I mean, she, she, I mean, it was, she had some absolutely incredible, incredible, um, um, just uh, like, just from what I've seen in the director's tent, like just shots, just, even just like, watching it without any edits or cuts and you just and like everything has to be silent but like your mind is silent you're just watching that level of engagement um and, and i think still a lot of the best is yet to come uh out of bitsy's performance uh, uh oh and, um daya's performance as well i mean what an, what an incredible actress she is and my my good buddy now chad Bruno Mannheim. Ugh. And I think uh, we're all in for a treat when we uh, end up seeing Michael Cudlitz. Um, that was another performance in which it was just like the talk of the town. Like it, it, Everyone was like, like, it's rare to impress film people. Uh, so I look forward to everyone seeing that. In terms of Lois's cancer diagnosis, what was your reaction to first reading those scripts? Like, did it come as a surprise to you, having that kind of be a central part of the Kent storyline this season? Um. So, well, it came as in a surprise when I heard it. Right, I did hear it way before the scripts. I uh, strangely heard it in Amsterdam. Uh, we were staying in my brother's friend's house in Amsterdam for like three days, uh, and I did a big Zoom meeting with Todd and Brent, and they outlined. Um, they outlined a solid plan for a um, long time. I'm not going to try to spoil how long, uh, especially, but a very long term plan. And my jaw was on the floor the whole time hearing it. I mean, it was just so detailed. It was so nuanced. Every character had a thing to do. And it was all really central to um, that Lois cancer storyline. You know, every season themes seems to have a theme. Right. The first one was about heritage. Um, I, I think a big part of it was heritage, just discovering uh, who you were. Um, big themes about growing up. Uh, big themes about fitting in. Um, so, yeah, it's a lot about place. The second season was a lot about um, finding out who you are. Right. It's discovery of oneself. Right. Uh, and, and, you know, how that could be used in a malicious sense um, in the case of Lois's sister um, and and everyone that was indoctrinated by Allie and how everyone seems to have this shadow self as opposite of what they are, um, very Jungian. Um, and then this season has a big theme of loss, 
Um, everyone seems to be dealing with loss in a different way. Um, you know, whether whether that's um, loss of self, loss of health, loss of life. Um, there's there's so many different elements of loss uh, and how one deals with it. So and, and and you know how loss can really manifest in some of these more incredible ways. Um, yeah, this entire season from the outset was laid out in a brilliant, 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 brilliant way by our writers. Um, and and that's why I mean I I I think it might be my favorite. Um, and it, it's great to be on a show that gets better. And, I mean, it, it's rare. I, I don't know that rare, but it, it's it's pretty incredible to be on a show, especially a show, a show like this, and say that season three is your favorite. And I'm seeing a lot of people say that. Um, all the more case to get a season four because we have great stuff we would love to tell there too. But uh, we'll, we'll find that out. The Bitsy, like you mentioned, her performance has just been tearing at me this whole season, how she is processing her emotions and her needs. And um, you mentioned like, you know, this past episode, they go to the fortress, they find her will. Uh, and Jonathan's been the one who's been more vocal about how this has been affecting him, maybe facing his own kind of mortality. Where do you think Jordan's mindset is at? you know, watching his brother kind of go through kind of this inner, inner turmoil, like they both are, but he's been a lot more um, outwardly expressive about it to their parents. Right. I, I think Jordan's head is he 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 knows more than Jonathan, right? Like Jordan Jordan does have a well also maybe a cockiness from his invulnerability so far. And he's he's seen a lot of high stakes disappear around him. Um but also like, you know, he's the one hearing her sick. He's the one that directly kind of observes it due to his powers. Whereas Jonathan's more on the outskirts trying to look in and there's a lot of frustration there. Uh I think we see Jordan really upset at the whole thing when the wills are found uh because that's more tangible evidence and there was a scene there that uh we were i think they were trying to, uh, in my opinion we we're trying to mirror the pilot uh where jordan was very upset at finding out about his dad uh because he, he just got a bunch of contacts as to why he didn't feel right his whole life and jonathan kind of laid back well in this case when the human one is dealing with human problems you see kind of jonathan at the forefront what has been your favorite season sorry no no that was just we're just getting a little piano background um what has been your favorite season three scene so far favorite season three scene so far oh, i'm trying to think of the stuff that aired um because i have one that hasn't aired um I have a very clear one that hasn't aired. Uh, I would say. Uh, the scene in the car with Dylan Walsh when he gives me the goggles. Yeah, uh, getting to work with Dylan Walsh every single time is an incredible honor and pleasure. Uh, I'm so grateful to be working with him uh, and getting to go one-on-one -on -one with him like that. I mean, it, it just that's incredible. Uh, also, in that scene, I had my own little idea that they so graciously let me put in. Um, you know, sometimes writers are super collaborative like these guys are, and it's just incredible. Um, when I saw the goggles for the suit, because I've seen this suit all the way until, like, from the first day of shooting, we were trying to, like, make the suit right. Um, and they have these goggles, to, I think, to try to mirror um, 90 Superboy um, in a way. And when I saw the aviator goggles, I, went, uh, I actually asked Todd, I said, well, what if uh, the goggles were from General Lane's, I said grandfather, but father, um, when he fought in the war. And that's that gives context to Lane being a soldier. Um, and then it also gives a sentimental value to these goggles that feel a little otherworldly. Um, getting some background music here, which I think for my mom in the other room. Um, <laughs> <laughs> not sure if you can hear it um yeah so i'm i'm so happy that i got my little writing element in that's such an honor uh and then at the same time i am overjoyed to have worked with dylan in that capacity and I'll, by the way the kid really got his haircut in that it, there's a shot of the kid getting his haircut the kid was getting his haircut uh so we only really had one good take to do that happy we got it in 
I love that scene. I mean, there were some tense moments and it was episode four having that dialogue opposite Dylan. Um, I mean, was it easy to kind of be in that moment and and go through some of go through that scene because you had like the thin Lizzie comment which obviously to the viewer you know that's kind of funny that's comical but it turned um kind of combative really quickly especially when Jordan kind of dismissed his grandfather you know kind of knowing what it felt like um the words oh you don't even know what that means that's what he he said to him so how is it with Dylan as a scene partner and having to kind of go through that moment because you don't get a lot of one-on-one scenes with him Right. I mean, Dylan is an incredible scene partner. He has reams of experience with A-list actors. I mean, so uh, getting to work with him is a dream. Um, yeah, Thin Lizzy comment disturbed Jordan. I mean, the hair is such a big part of Jordan's identity. It represents him so much uh, that the notion of having to get rid of it to him is unacceptable. Um, you know, he's not one to really, he cares deeply about certain things in excess, uh, whereas most people care about a lot of things at a, at, a, at a tangible, at a at a regulatable level, he cares about certain things, like Sarah, um, like some of his stuff at school in season one, um, and, and his hair, parts of his identity, um, in excess. So, yeah, he struck a chord there with Jordan, uh, and I also, I'm you know, I'm happy I can keep my hair for now, you know, um, my luscious locks, but I seem to have a tradition now, uh, because I've been getting my hair cut over in Vancouver. Also, I'm a very directional person. I'm literally pointing west when I'm talking about Vancouver. <laughs> um, over in Vancouver, I, um, yeah, uh, uh, I, I get my hair cut, obviously, by the people that do my hair there. And I don't really have a barber here anymore that I really trust. So I just grow it until I get back to Vancouver. So if I don't, you know, if season four does not get announced, you're about to see me in a couple of years, just hair down to my hips, flowing in the thin Lizzie. I'm, uh, you yeah, know, actually, that will actually come true. So we need a season but, four, but <laughs> some old school you're like, I, I do need that kinda. haircut. Yeah, What's yeah it's funny. getting long. It's already getting long. I, I mean, it, it just, it does, it does go. To, I, I used to wear it down to like my chest. But at the end of that episode, um he kind of sets him up Jordan sets him up on senior swipe so I don't know do you think we'll see any success with that later on in the season there's a lot of love I, in the air so far for everyone but love. Jordan it seems there's a lot of love going on yeah um senior swipe yeah you know old stage adage you don't introduce a gun on the stage unless it will be shot by the end of the play that's all I'm gonna say that's all I'm gonna say I feel like that makes sense. I mean, we don't want unfinished plot holes everywhere, but um, you mentioned the goggles. It was such a nice family tie in. So I'm glad that they kind of um, took that idea of yours in terms of the suit we see so far. I don't know. It looks a bit like a scuba wet suit. It keeps the hair in check. What was that kind of material made out of? And what was it like putting that on for the first time? Because um, as I anticipate, and I think as you've alluded to, I mean, it's not the final version. It's kind of been worked on as a season goes along. Right. Um, yeah, that suit itself, uh, it's made out of, I actually don't know what's made. It's, it's made out of a lot of really interesting high-tech materials, actually, in real life. Um, putting it on is bizarre. I mean, like, I, I, I saw it at every stage. I saw it from measuring to, like, a piece of cloth I put around me to slowly a shirt to a thing to a thing to a thing. It got built so slowly around me. It's like a frog boiling in water. Uh, you know, you don't realize you're cooking until you're cooking. Um, a little dark. Um, <laughs> um, it really hit me that I was wearing the suit. Um, not even the first time I wore it, actually. It really hit me uh, in a coming episode. You may or may not see me on a dark road in that suit. And I remember sitting out there and they were doing the wide shot. And so there's just a light on me. It's rainy. And I was in the middle of a road. There's a camera all the way over there. And I had to jump in and I'm in the suit. And I've seen Tyler do that. And I went. Whoa. 
12 year old me is having a great day. I'm happy he's here to see it. Um, yeah, I mean, it's an emotional moment when you get to really realize what you're doing. I'm having one of those right now. Um, it's, it's crazy. I mean, you go from you go from a dude in school to pushed away during a pandemic, shooting at this big set with all this responsibility and 200 people or more than that, their lives, their livelihoods depend on you. Um, and then you end up at a convention and people are coming up to you and saying they're a big fan of you and uh, and they're all they're all so excited to meet you and, and you're thinking to myself, I'm thinking to myself, excited to meet me. I, I, should, I should still be in high school. Yeah, you um, talk you about know. these defining moments um, and those are like a few for you. And um, we'll talk about the convention before we circle back just because you brought it up. But does it still surprise you to be invited back? I mean, you've you've been to so many already and we're only kind of three seasons in. Um, you've met people like William Shatner, the Trailer Park Boys. So how have those oh. experiences been? Oh, I mean, first of all, the Trailer Park Boys are good friends now with my father, which is ridiculous because uh, they're around the same age and around the same mannerisms. Uh, and I'm buddies with them, too. Like, believe me, I love those guys. Those, those guys, like, we, we're we all actual buddies. Like, we're actually friends. It's not like some, like, like stupid post a picture. Like, we're actually friends. Like, they, uh, my father and, and, and John Paul Tremblay call each other all the time now. It's ridiculous. Um, William Shatner was an honor to meet him uh, and get along with him. Uh, so well, we tweet at each other now. I mean, that's ridiculous. I, I really, I, 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 you know, meeting meeting the fans is, I think, even more bizarre. I mean, I feel like I've kind of almost been around celebrities for a large part of my life, uh, just by living in New York, just by um, from the Peanuts movie and that kind of stuff. But being a celebrity is something I don't know if I'll ever get used to. Um, you know, uh, meeting everyone uh, that feels so excited to meet me. And you know, I'm, that's why I always take my time to talk to everyone. You know, I'm, I'm still a big people's person. I, you know, I, 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 went, to, I went to dinner with a, a business contact yesterday on some of this UN stuff. We're talking about this thing, 2050 forums and blah, 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 blah. And meanwhile, I, I like the, People on uh, the other tables know me from the five minutes he was late. <laughs> I'm a big talker. I'm big, in case you couldn't tell. Uh, so I do love meeting all the fans. That that's a real joy for me. And I'm gonna be in Austin. I'm gonna be in Austin this summer. I want to say it's June 24th, 23rd. Uh, so people, come on out, come see me. Um, I uh, yeah, I, I would love to meet everyone. Uh, I I just I love meeting everyone that loves the show. Uh, I love you all back. You know, if anyone's in Austin, you better show up. Right. <laughs> Have those conversations right. with Alex. Uh, I want to talk about a couple other scenes in episode three: the uh, Metropolis party. Anything in particular mm -hmm. you remember from that one? I mean, right. he had a productive talk. I think at the time with with Sarah, played some beer pong. That um, that line where she stood up for him, she threw the beer. <laughs> yeah, that was really sweet. I mean, I, I also. Not to be this guy. I think that was episode three, two. Um, but I'm just like that. I'm that guy. But um, yes, she stood up for him um, through all of that, right? Through all of the distance, she still stood up for him. For him. Um, and uh, the, I really enjoyed doing those one-on-one -on -one scenes with her that day. That house was insane. The set was crazy. It was all these people. I mean, like, it used to be um, a bit of culture shock being around other people my age again. Like in season one, I remember we had a party scene and I was like around a bunch of other 17 year olds. And I don't think I've seen a 17 year old in a year at that point. And it was just like, whoa. Um, then again, there still was a strange, there's, you're, you're on a set and I'm, obviously I'm not going to be unprofessional even at that age. But 
Yeah, so it's always fun when you have a bunch of background actors that are all around your age, let alone in a mansion. I mean, there's a bowling alley right behind. So if, if you saw where I was splashed, where I was standing right behind me is actually a little bowling alley. Uh, so it was insane, like a ridiculous wine collection. Just looking at these wines and it's like, this one's from 1912. Okay. You just wanted a um, house tour at that point. Yeah, so I, that whole day was really fun to shoot. I love that moment of Sarah standing up for Jordan. In the end of the day, it's like anyone. Um, even if you're really pissed off at someone, if you've loved them before, unless they've really betrayed you, um, you're going to stick up for them. And, you know, it's just how it is. I could be fighting with my brother at any given moment in real life. We could be in a bitter fight. And in the end of the day, we're always there for each other. You know, it's just how it is. Uh, I, I and I, I would say that about my exes as well. Like, um, I don't think I, I, I really don't have a single ex that uh, <laughs> would, I guess. <laughs> um, but um, that I, I think I would really not stick up for. Having your people and still having that bond, and it's still long lasting. Um, Sweet Sixteen at the barn. There's a video for the twins. Now, the real question is: is There any chance? We see the boys and Grandpa Sam in their matching Hawaiian shirts. You talk about, you know, putting these eggs out there and not having it come back. I know that one might have been a little too small, but I still think that would be a, a cute moment. I would family photo op. We we certainly had enough Hawaiian shirts when me and Michael actually went to Hawaii. Um, yeah, I, I don't, I don't know. I, I can't remember. <laughs> not that, sure that, about that, that one. But yeah, it, I'm it not would, sure about that one. It would be one. sweet. It would be sweet. I, you know, like in, the, in season one, they did such a great job. Like that little device that Talro uses to probe someone's mind. It ends up saving Jordan. They do bring it back. I Like they're very, very smart people, the writers. Um, you know, we should all make sure they get treated really fairly. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I will see. We'll see if it comes back. We'll see. End of episode two, when Lois and Clark tell the boys about her cancer diagnosis, um, they embrace her. So emotional, yet the trademark music playing in the background, the muted dialogue. Take me through filming that one. Right. That one has a funny story as well. Uh, so if you know anything about filming, you know, there are these people called stand-ins where they, their job is to stand in. They're vaguely your size, completely different face, but vaguely your size, vaguely your color. Uh, and they stand where you're supposed to stand uh, so that they can properly light the scene so that actors can come in and do the performance without them having to do a million different versions, right? Because they need lights to be in a certain place, the camera to be in a certain place. So uh, what, when we, when Michael and I did our reaction to Lois and Clark sitting there, we're like, we're coming in, we're coming from the party, coming from the party. And then we see them and they're sitting like, like the energy comes out of the room. It was the stand-ins sitting there, perfectly lit for the next shot. So it looked like Tyler and Bitsy decided to just switch skins with people. And so it actually took a number of takes to not laugh because we were really trying to get into it. And it's a, such a serious moment. And um, we're, wa we're walking in. And we're just trying to, and like, we just see two people that do not look like them. It was like, um, have you ever watched SpongeBob? Big part of my generation's humor. I'm sure you watched as well. Uh, you know those hyper realistic close ups. You know what I'm talking about where they just like go in and like it's a completely different art art style. That's what it was like. It was just it was too much. We got it down though eventually. And then for the rest of that scene when they were actually there and we all hugged each other, uh, that was a that was that was very emotional. Yeah. Jordan and Jonathan fighting over a hoodie in episode four. I thought yeah. that was so funny given the context of their world. Like, you know, Jordan can't just fly somewhere, get a new hoodie, come home. They have to be fighting over that same one. Right. Right. That's how it is, though. It's my favorite color. It's da -da 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 -da. Hey, by the way, I'm the guy who wears hoodies in the family. I think uh, I had dibs over that one, whatever color that was. A lot of that was improv as well, if I remember correctly. There was some of it that wasn't, but I think like leading up, like the there was some ad libs in the beginning, just screaming at each other. Um, yes, yes, indeed. Also, I think it was like the first time I wore short sleeves in the show, and then I was like, oh my god, I gotta look super. And I was like trying to like do some push ups between the takes. 
You're like, I gotta stay competitive here on that front. Like, I oh my god, I'm like, well, you're not even comparative. I just gotta. I mean, I've been working out like crazy lately as well because if we do get a season four, I want to come back just ripped as possible. Uh, you gotta live up to the character. Part of that progression, the thing we were talking about before, the years long progression. A uh, big part of that is um, physicality. Uh, so I've really worked hard to try to get the physicality. It's why I got my gold sash, and that was a big thing as well. Um, a lot of training there to try to become a better, a more mobile fighter. Um, and also now I just love gung fu, but uh, also the physicality of just getting bigger. I needed to do that. I wish I could get taller. I wish I was a little bit taller. You know, I wish I was a baller. Uh, I wish I had a girl I could meet. I could call her. I wish I had a, what is it? A bat with a hat with a fat. I don't know. <laughs> you know it's an I'm impromptu talking. rap, like trying to, trying to sound it out, feel it out. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> so in terms of um just moving forward the rest of the season like what can you tease to fans viewers about the final suit that we will see at the end of the season i can't sing very much today but you're excited show. <laughs> but what i say is stay tuned He's also had to gain the trust of his dad as he comes into his power. So how has Tyler been for you as a scene partner? And um, I would say leader, co-lead, if you say Bitsy and their kind of power dynamics um, with the Kents. How has he been as a leader on the show? Oh, Tyler's a phenomenal leader. Uh, he has a lot of kindness. He has uh, an incredible work ethic. Uh, the number one, they say, sets the tone of the show. And he set the tone that we are all happy to be there. Um, so that's a huge credit to him. Uh, I could not give him enough credit, uh, for his decorum and also his performance. Uh, someone picked the right guy for the job with, with, with Bitsy as well. I mean, just look at her performance. Now, Lois and Clark express a desire to have another child early on. That's unknown to the boys. How do you think Jordan would have reacted had he known? He would have... Hating it. Yeah, he would have hated it. Full stop. <laughs> I don't think he would have hated it. <laughs> I don't think there was a part of him that would have liked that it's a little screaming baby. I mean, he didn't even like. I was about to spoil. <laughs> yeah, wait. He doesn't like spoiler? something later on. Doesn't like something. Some other change of personnel in the house. Later on, I don't know if it aired yet. I don't think it has. I mean, um, he definitely didn't like Candace. I mean, Candace. Okay, was... Candace is what I was talking about. I, okay. I, I, <laughs> evidence of uh, that I don't watch the show. Um, but um, Tyler doesn't either. He's my excuse. Um, <laughs> Does he not? <laughs> no, no. He's very public about that too. Um, actors can be very critical of their own performance, and it gets in your head. Um, and I don't know if that's his reason, but. Certainly it was part of mine. And now it's more out of, uh, I was like, I, I, if people like what I'm doing. I don't want to change it in any way. Um, yeah. Uh, didn't like Candace in the house. Hated Candace. Hated Candace being there. Didn't want her there. Yeah, there were good reasons for her to be there. Get out of my room, please. Get out of my brother's room. Give me my space. I think you use my toothbrush. Also, how come Candace, well, Candace living in with Jonathan, right? I don't even want to know what Jordan might have heard with his super hearing. Lois and Clark know how to hide it. They've been dealing with it. Come on. Discretion. He did call her his mortal enemy. I was curious about that, though, if some of that came from a place of genuinely not liking her or just genuinely being a bit upset because he knows that they are in a happy relationship. So, I mean, a baby could be something new, you know, but I, I do think that he probably it's not the it's not the right time for for a baby in his stat, stats. I don't think he wants a baby. I think they got enough going on. Um. Like, they got a lot going on. And that was, like, the argument in season, in episode one was, like, we got a lot going on. I am Superman. I saved the world. You're Lois Lane. You report everything and have to deal with dangerous people every day. And we got a superhero son. 
who doesn't really know what the hell he's doing, uh, is growing into it. Then we got a non superhero son who doesn't have superpowers and everyone else has superpowers. And what do you do with that? Um, and then you're going to have the baby coming in. Let's talk about Bruno Mannheim briefly. You touched on it. Like, I know you and Chad are friends now. You spent time with him and his family. You saw Broadway play together. What layers has he brought to the show with his character? And how about that Pia, Bruno, and Matteo family reveal that just happened uh, on yesterday's episode? I know some of it came as a surprise, some not so much. But what are your thoughts and takes on all of that? Yeah, we were certainly foreshadowing um, Mateo being a part of that family a lot. So people caught on, which is a good thing. It's like, I don't know like how people, like people, I think that's foreshadowing. That's part of the literary process. Um, But yes, um, so yeah, they're all incredible actors. Every one of them. I mean, Spencer, his career is blowing up right now. He's on that movie on the strip with all these A-list actors. And he's like one of the leads using Creed. Uh, you know, he's just blown up. He's an incredible actor. Diet, incredible actress. Um, and then Chad, incredible actor. I think Chad goes back to theater, you know. Um, he's a big theater, so is Diet. They're both big theater actors, which is where I came from. So I think that's why we related so much. Uh, Chad, uh, you know, he's a big source of wisdom for me, uh, which I'm really happy about as well. Uh, I love to see how he gave this character so much depth. Having a villain with depth really adds so much to everything. So yeah, it's, it's pretty awesome. Yeah, and getting to see you know him and Pia and kind of their love story and before proceeding like Hobbs Bay and everything we see him, we think he's this big criminal. But you mentioned depth and a lot of layers. Uh, this season already, you've worked with amazing directors: Tom Cavanaugh, David Ramsley, uh, Elizabeth Henstridge, superheroes in their own right. Tell me about what you've learned through their work and instruction. Oh, I mean, un un speakable amounts uh you know you have david ramsey a guy who's now directing all sorts of television shows everywhere same with lil Helmstridge. um yeah i uh, unspeakable amounts i mean look i actually not to, uh, and tom cavanaugh also wait i'm sorry tom who's the best person i love tom so much i i, I always say that but I, I, and he loves me back i know it um i love that guy i'm so i'm so happy to get to work with him again this season um I don't think it'd be understated Gregory Smith, uh, who's our supervising producer. He directed more episodes than anyone. Uh, not only is he an incredible director, gets it done faster and better than everyone. <laughs> like just that, that kind of guy. He's also an incredibly nice guy. And also he was an actor for a long time and we're very similar people. So I, I, I really love Greg. Um, he's going to be a lifelong friend. Same with the rest. Um, but yeah, when people ask me, like, of the actor directors who I learned the most from, I think it would be hard not to say him, just if also just because of how much time we've spent together now. It was on a Canadian, like, I think police drama that I watched, whose name is escaping me. I think it was like Rookie Blue. Yes, Rookie Blue. Yes. <laughs> That was a good show. So it was really nice to see him kind of coming into his own as a director because he's done a lot of these Arrow Arrowverse kind of shows now. We'll get into social media as we round out. I wanted to talk about at Daily Alex Garfin on Instagram. I think today is day 133. So tell me about your relations with that account. Um, it's kind of incredible to see that persistence and dedication. I mean, that's ridiculous. I, look, first of all, some people think it's me. It is not me. Um, it, it, it is someone else. I will say that right now. Um, I don't think some people will believe me, but it is It is not me. Uh, I used to follow a bunch of those daily accounts. Like, it was just like a big part of my life, right? I would be like, it'd be like same picture of, um, be like same picture of a cucumber every day, same picture of this every day. And you'd be shocked and in awe of the dedication of people. Richard, every day, that guy, Richard. Richard, I just smashed your phone. Um, like, 
I, I, I follow a lot of those accounts. I grew up following those accounts. Never in my right mind would I think there'd be an Alex Garfin every day. Um, like some people are like, why don't they post different pictures every day? I've had these conversations. The why don't they post different pictures every day? Like you don't get it. You don't get it. The meme is that you literally are so dedicated. That's why it's so incredible. Um, also, my mom, like, I think DM'd them. I think they've had a whole conversation now. Um, I like every single one. Uh, so does Quillerin, who works on my show. So does Milo, that actor from the other show. He used to like everyone. I don't know if he likes them all now. I think he still likes a lot of them. Um, I like how they didn't switch it to Milo Mannheim every day. No, it's still Alex Garvin every day. I like each one has a prompt. It's such a community on there. I scroll. That one I scroll on. I don't scroll any of those other things where people may not be nice anymore, but I know what I scroll on. Um, <laughs> yes, and then, like they have a little thing, the Empire, every time I've like posted them. I'm trying to keep it going. I say I let's get it. to a thousand. I want to be talking like three and a half years of being like, yes, it's at a thousand. How old will I be? I will be 22 years old. Wow. I think it's very possible. Um, I admire um, their, like I mentioned, their persistence. And we'll get to 200 first, and then we'll get to a year. I think like it increments, but it is nice to see. I know there are comments on them. So there is like, it's some interaction. It's not just the, the photo and that's all. No, I think, think they have prompts. People write essays on there. I mean, come on. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start, I'm going to start like, sh I should start doing a partnership with them. Do you so know I anything about out. them? Like the person no, who- No idea of who they them. are or where they are. It really, it really, really, I have no idea. They could tomorrow start posting some crazy things that I don't agree with. And I'd have to like explain away how the account that posted me every day. Like I have no control over that account. Like, you know- It's they, all a mystery, but want. that that's part of the, I think um, what makes it interesting and intriguing. Yes. Yes, it is. I, I I love all the fan accounts. I try to give them as much life as possible. Um, I used to have the philosophy of like just let them do their thing, but now you know I want to support my people that are supporting me. Um, it, it's bizarre though. It's all parasocial, right? It's like you know, no one really knows each other. They think they know you. You don't know them. They don't really know you. Uh, so you got to just take it as support of what you do, support of your craft, support of the interviews you put out, the, the carefully crafted persona that is uh, a part of every public figure's life. Um, so in that, I, I really graciously accept their support. Um, yeah, um, it, it's really great. I want to I keep it alive. I want to keep acting. I want to keep, uh, keep using my acting to try to be the change I wish to see in the world. Um, I want to keep writing songs and playing music and um, entertaining. Uh, that's, that's that's all I really want to do is entertain. Speaking about entertaining, um, we'll go through some tweets now. <laughs> so if you oh, could... Oh, wow. I, I didn't, I, we didn't even get to that. Yes, let's do it. We're almost at the finish line. This no, has been no, such no, a good no, conversation. Don't be rushing us. <laughs> so number one, twitter.com. Slash T Hochelin <laughs> Hecklin uh, net slash status slash one six four three three five eight one seven three oh seven oh three four eight two nine three. Let's go. Alex Garfin shared this photo with Tyler Hecklin as a part of the meme he made today during his IG takeover of Superman and Lois. No one, Zeta Row. That's right. Can we right. talk about the meme you shared? So it's always chaotic, I think, um, in yeah. the best possible way when you do take over the Superman and Lois accounts. But what what what's with this meme? Like, tell me about what's running through your mind. You obviously you see that photo and you say, "This is what I want to do with this this picture today." Some judgment in there, isn't there? I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah. I engage with people. I talk to people on their level. I, you know, I, I got, when I first took the race, like my first takeover, um, you know, I, it, it's like, I, I realized that, um, it, like you got to talk to people and people talk to people. Yeah. I, I could carefully curate 
and I, there's a lot of juice to that as well. Really carefully curating a whole takeover um, in a very professional way. But I think what really gets people engaged in your life and the show's life is being someone that they feel like they can talk to, being someone that they people like. And it's funny to post the memes. Post them. Why not? It's funny. Um, I laughed. I thought it was, yeah. I mean, it was I, very accurate to what, has to what well, happened in happened. the show yeah and is it always interesting challenge for you to play um a character in your own body like a different character other than jordan oh yeah no i mean i remember calling tom cavanaugh first time i ever spoke to him and he goes listen here kid i played 14 something 16 very different versions of wells on flash i got you so working with him was really helpful that episode um yeah, that's funny. The memes are funny. Why not? Would Who's you call yourself them? like a, a meme, um, a meme king? Like, do you just look at memes? Do you send them to your friends? <laughs> I was going to say, do you create a lot more or? I think my brain works on memes. I do send a lot of memes to my friends. My friends do open their sh phones on Instagram, like 14 things sent to them. Um, I lie. I like to laugh. I like jokes. I like humor. Who doesn't? Yeah. It's funny. I'm goofing on it. And people engage with it. So why not? Um, it's, it was ridiculous. Uh, I mean, like there was even a bit of poking fun. I, I was the, the, the day um, Trump was getting um, arraigned um, in New York. I was going to my gym, which is near Trump Tower. And I was like, screw it. And I saw the massive crowd of press, massive crowds of people. And I was like, this would be hilarious. It was during my takeover. Look, all these people are here to watch Superman and Lois. Very clearly here to watch Superman and Lois. And then uh, 9, 8 Central on the CW. And all these people. <laughs> you know, why not? No oh, fun at the world. It's funny. Goofing on them. Is your um Superman and Lois squad like group chat? almost exclusively memes sent by Alex. That's what I was actually going to mention is TikTok because, I mean, who do I have to talk to to get that account more active? You have the the one with Michael, Indian Taylor, and you must have more behind the scenes. Where's where's that at? Yeah, that was, uh, look, we're trying to drum up press for the show, right? In any means necessary here in these turbulent times. Um, also, it was fun to do that. I like the joint TikTok. I, I wish we were more active. Um, I'm not very active on my own TikTok. I, 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 I try to post on there every once in a while. But I um, we'll, we'll, we'll try. I mean, we're literally, Michael is in Australia. I'm in New York City. Taylor and India are in California. So I suppose there might be some collaboration on their part. We all have the keys to the account. We can all post on it whenever. Why not? Season four, come on. Um, <laughs> we'll get more I there. I know. I want to get it drumming up, too. I, I I wouldn't mind that. We played some fun games on there. Alex Garfin is fine as hell. I really just like a guy with some eyebrows. By if Batman has one hater, I am that hater. At yeah, bleep. So you're saying I'm sexier than Batman. nothing wrong with a compliment right i mean you don't um you're not very active on twitter so i'm sure you don't see some of this stuff no um but that's really funny i, I like a guy with some eyebrows come on i mean i'll take it i'll take it uh you know if i if i i actually plucked my eyebrows yesterday I put my masculinity aside and did it because i had a full unibrow um I, i'd love to see what they think then Go all natural. <laughs> I love that Alex Garvin's facial hair looks like mine when he doesn't shave. Short kings with weird sideburns. Let's go. go. Let's go. Let's go. I know, I know. I, the muttons get large and nothing else. And short kings, let's go. I, I am in fact 5'9". And I'm living my life so well. All the way down here. You know, it's, it's, it's warmer closer to the earth.
we're more in tune with the earth's core you know uh you know all these people up there they they they, they, they gonna get colds from the wind burn up there past six feet um <laughs> i love it i love it you think alice garfin vince mathis and michael bishop have a group chat dedicated to be tyler hecklin's son <laughs> i suppose there's a, there's a fourth there isn't there um but um no we do not no we do no we do not i don't think no michael and vince have never met why would have they um uh vince and i are really good friends he lives in new york uh very strangely me and my mom went downtown i was taking her out for dinner like a good son uh we went all the way downtown to a random stop on the train got off and went, walked to a random block and then just saw Vince. Um, so like, I feel, I feel like I run into Vince a lot too. But yeah, he's a really good buddy of mine. Like, like, uh, like his friend group is all my friends now. Like, the, he knows all my friends. He's almost like a friend from home, less than a friend from work. Um, yeah, I know it's funny though. That's funny. We're all the Tyler Hecklin sons. There is certainly an alternate universe where Vince is Jonathan or Jordan as well. Um, yeah, we should have a group chat. We should have I mean, him with have... Tyler and call him Papa. I think he would hate that. <laughs> he would be like, leave the group chat right away. <laughs> He's not a text. Very famously not a texter. You can, you can text him that the world's ending. He will not pick up. Uh, he's a caller. You got to call him. He'll answer. You have called Vince, your brother, one, one universe removed, which I think is a fun way to describe your relationship. I mean, cameo one day. Like, he could cameo on the show. You wouldn't I be know, against I that. Want I don't know how to set up a cameo. Someone tell me. <laughs> Being brutally honest here, I would totally be doing them. If I, 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 I just don't really know exactly how to set it up. Um, I feel like I missed also a big wave of it, like earlier on. But uh, yes, I think it's still cameo, hit me up. I uh, think that you though need that account because people could, I mean, send you a lot of requests, song requests. I'm sure. <laughs> right. Right, I can write a song. I can write a song for them. It, it won't be good. It'll be a song. Eh? <laughs> Permanent rain. Oh, press. <laughs> Just little jingles. Doesn't have to be fancy. Just, yeah, right, right. Little, little. <laughs> Permanent rain. Press. Don't you know that they're the best? They were my first interview. And now we must continue. Uh, yeah, yes, yeah. I think it's work. On my cameo. They emailed me. Cameo emailed me back when the show started, and I like just lost the email. My email. I, I just feel like it hasn't been on the front burner. Yeah, I, I I'm gonna set up a cameo. A cameo to come. Can't be that hard. <laughs> me and Carol Baskin. It's a final tweet now. Okay, by Biffy Bamps. Alex Garfin as Armand. Do you okay. know who that is? <laughs> it is a character from someone was trying to fan cast you in Interview with the Vampire. So that's an AMC oh. series that I know your friend Bailey. Um, she was in season one. So people were trying to get you on that show. But on that kind of general topic, like it's it must always be a compliment for you to be fan cast and have people see you as as other characters. Yeah, that is a huge, huge compliment. I'm not gonna lie. Uh, when people say I could play other things, that's 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 always like that is the best thing you can tell an actor to make them like you. <laughs> Um, also, it'd be a pleasure to work with Bailey. Um, yeah, Bailey's one of my oldest friends. Bailey was actually my first kiss. Um, not real one, but we were in a commercial together when we were like literally eight. And she kissed me on the cheek in the commercial. Um, Purell commercial with Melina Wiseman as well. 
weird little combo, the three of us, before anyone had a career. Um, <laughs> and then we actually re-met in high school. And then we, so we've, we've been friends forever. Like, we, we go back before either of us were, like, big actors or not calling myself a big actor, but, you know, like, professionals and all that. Um, so, yeah, it would be great to work with her. And, yeah, cast me other things. I'm all in for it. Um, uh, that would that would be great to be in um, IWV interview, as they call it. Which, uh, oh yeah, I asked you that. I was like, what do you, what's the short term for interview with a vampire? She goes, interview. And did that get confusing during press days? Yes. I know, you're just yeah, like throwing out that word interchangeably and you're kind of thinking like, okay. But I mean, that shows she was so good in, in season one. I know that she has other projects on the horizon. I mean, Avatar, you must have seen that. She ne yeah, she, she never stops working. She's one of those that just cannot stop working and cannot stop success from knocking on her door. She's incredible. She's talented. Uh, she's beautiful. And, jewelry and business, she's entrepreneur. Amazing. Yes, her jewelry company, which is doing well. Like she, she is one of the most incredible people ever. Um, so lucky to be her friend. She's so incredibly kind. I love her family so much. Uh, like her mom is family to me as well. So um, yeah, cannot. You know, she's also. I, I'm also biased of her being one of my oldest and greatest friends. That's so sweet. I mean, hopefully you get to work together in the future, maybe do a commercial revisited. Uh, I have one final question for you. Uh, wild card question. If you competed on Master Chef, what would you make as your signature dish and why? And it could either be something you cook or you bake. My Master Chef signature dish. That's an interesting one. Really got to think here. Of stuff I already know how to make. I used to be a big pizza guy. I used to wake up early in the morning. Let the dough leaven all day. I used to buy a gallon of milk. Animal Rene. Make my own mozzarella cheese. Buy tomatoes. Make tomato paste, tomato sauce. Dice tomatoes and then make the actual pizza sauce myself. Had a basil plant. Would put all these ingredients together by, I start at 8 a.m., usually by 10 p.m., put it in the oven on a pizza stone, and then couldn't get it out of the oven. That happened twice while making it, and it flipped over, and thus was the end of pizza. I don't know if I could take that heartbreak again. You know, if I was on Master Chef, I, I think I would really just want to be cooking up a dream. A dream that one day we could all cook. Whether that that is, that is cooking or, or baking, simply frying an egg. But really, in the end of the day, the true chef was never us in the end. The true chef was in our heart. All along. Your okay, so your piano is like it's been so spotty, so it's been like in and out, but I get the gist, and I feel like the pizza, it you're right, it wouldn't fly because usually you have maybe like an hour to make your signature dish. So I don't know how it works. The, I've I, never I, seen the show. I like the ambition, but you might be going home first. Yeah. Yeah. Uh or last. <laughs> Never You'll be in last studio. place. I'm still working. <laughs> yeah, but um, I, 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 I love that answer. I mean, maybe you need to work on your cooking skills, but you have a lot on your plate, so I don't think Master Chef is is first and foremost. Did you mean to do that? <laughs> it just came out. I love it. 
I, I love it. You know, that, that it it does sound funny. It's almost like a dad joke. We'll we'll say that. Yeah. I don't have those too often, but I think it works. Oh. And this was such a nice conversation getting to catch up with you. Thank you so, so much, Alex, for taking the time. Thank you for having me. It's always great to be here. Of course, and for all those who have stayed tuned until the end, you can catch Alex in Superman and Lois Season 3 new episodes Tuesdays on The CW, and we will see you next time. Yeah, yeah, yeah.